Two Baltimore police officers are on trial this week in federal court for some of the worst misconduct imaginable. They're part of a group of eight officers accused of robbery and extortion, faking evidence, and planting drugs, among other crimes. The officers were part of an elite group called the Gun Trace Task Force, set up by the mayor in 2007 to help fight rising crime and murder rates. The task force was supposed to check the flow of guns and get the worst guys off the street. And for a while, city leaders and reporters saw the task force as a huge success. But it was also completely corrupt, acting as what prosecutors have called a gang-style crime ring. Six of the officers have already pleaded guilty. But there's a bigger problem. The task force's misconduct has tainted hundreds, if not thousands, of criminal cases. And in a city already infamous for horrible policing, it's shattered any remaining trust between cops and the community. Antonia Hilton met some of the people trying to figure out how to clean up the mess. So frustrating. This is like, oh yeah, this cop was charged for false information. This cop is alleged to have planted evidence. All right. Deborah Levy is a Maryland public defender whose full-time job is now investigating the Gun Trace Task Force and trying to clear the names of its victims. I have a spreadsheet of about 2,000 cases in general that we're trying to undo. 2,000 cases. Yeah, 2,000 cases, and that's what we think would be a conservative number. I can't sleep at night because there's so many that I haven't undone. It's very stressful. It's really stressful. Her job is not simple. Cops' internal affairs complaints are shielded from reporters, lawyers, and the public by state laws that protect officers' privacy. Levy has to fight in court to unseal them. And she thinks the task force misconduct is just the tip of the iceberg. We're convinced that the web doesn't stop with the eight indicted officers. So we'll take each indictment. And on each indictment, it'll say, on this date, this officer is alleged to have engaged in conduct with this particular officer with these initials. We've then now started filing for the internal affairs documents for the other officers who were present on the scene that day to see if they were involved. In your opinion, do you think the Gun Trace Task Force ultimately made Baltimore more or less safe? Less safe. I think that absolutely 100% the city has pretty much fallen apart, right? The relationships between the police and the citizens of Baltimore. And that, at the end of the day, everything is based on trust. Oh, boy, man. Golly, golly, this guy ran into me with incarcerated with me. Man, man to see you on. I know you didn't even man. say I was on, man. That's why I pulled over just to holler at you. You know how I say what I say. The uh, police did some extra shit, some shit they weren't supposed to do. <laughs> yeah. January 2014, a group of officers, including two members of the Gun Trace Task Force, stormed Sean Whiting's home. The officers suspected he was a drug dealer and, he says, got a warrant to search his home under false pretenses. Once inside, Whiting says they tossed his house and stole $20,000 in cash, some of it drug money, and even took his children's video games. Certain things come to the light, you know what I mean? When you lie about certain things. Whiting filed a police misconduct complaint with Internal Affairs, but no one bought the story until 2017, when the cases piling up in federal indictments sounded very familiar. Do you think people listened to your voice, listened to what you were trying to tell them was going on? No, nah, they wouldn't listen to me at all. They wouldn't listen to me at all. Whiting's lawyer, Ivan Bates, helped him get his conviction overturned last year. Bates has reopened 19 cases involving the task force. In 17 of those cases, he's been able to get the charges dropped. I'm not that good. No one's that good. Unfortunately, the task force is just that bad. And when you sit what did down, you think when you read the indictments? Oh, I knew it was coming. I mean, I, I've been living it. I've been seeing it. You know, there were individuals in the indictment that I knew their cases simply when I just read the indictment. In this moment where we're post-Freddie Gray, consent decree, all these efforts to rehabilitate, and then this happens, 
What does this sort of represent for the city? Sometimes you have to hit rock bottom so you can get back up. An obvious question that will inevitably be asked of, of me and the mayor and many others is, you know, are we surprised by the findings of this report? Kevin Davis was appointed police commissioner in 2015, leading the department while the task force committed many of their crimes. There are neighborhoods that say, you didn't listen. And you know what, we doubt that it's even, that that brazen misconduct is confined to those eight guys. I can't argue uh, someone out of their experiences uh, or, or their emotions. And the trust thing, you know, I, I don't have an easy answer for that. Uh, I, I know that it's a, uh, you know, uh, the, our Goodwill bank account was significantly drawn upon by this incident. Should you have found out earlier? I have uh, three full-time internal affair detectives that are assigned to the FBI Baltimore Field Office Anti-Corruption Unit. The question, rather, for law enforcement is when, when bad things happen, and, and this is certainly a bad thing, you know, what are you willing to learn from it and what are you willing to acknowledge and do better to improve to decrease the likelihood that it'll ever happen again? Just a few days after our interview, Davis was fired by Mayor Catherine Pugh. We need violence reduction. We need the numbers to go down faster than they are. Do you think there's going to have to be some kind of public apology, public reckoning? I don't think we'll get that. I am not so interested in the public apology as much as I'm interested in getting to the bottom of it. Because until you do that, right, until we can be assured... Your like, apology doesn't mean very much. No, because I just still think there's still misconduct going on. I mean, there just has to be. In the meantime, she's stuck undoing the damage one person at a time. Hello? So you know how you called me about your conviction? Right. They're willing to undo not just your conviction, but your two co-defendants' convictions. Wow, that's, that's absolutely great. Uh, you, you deserve a raise. At this point, you can be very, very hopeful that everything's going to be expunged and it'll vanish off your record altogether. Thank you very much. I, I really do appreciate You're welcome. Take care. Okay. Bye. Right. Yay. For Sean Whiting, who was released in November 2017, it's three and a half years behind bars, three and a half years without his six kids. Have you had a hard time getting back on your feet since November? Hell yeah, hell yeah. You come from having a vehicle, you having a house, you having money, they take your money. It ain't like nobody giving me no free money. It's hard. It's hard he lives with his aunt now, having lost his house while incarcerated. Apologies and reform won't get any of that back. And we put them in the van, they go to our and die. It's past tense now. Yeah. Ain't nobody thinking about that. It's nobody thinking about it now. What's done is done. It's done. Does it make you angry? It don't make it. Not no more. No, nah, not no more. Because it's not going to change. It's not going to change. The only thing it's going to do is slow down. And before you know it, it's back at it again.